holistic transition, transitional justice. That's what we have today with uh, Danuta Polarczyk, and she is Polish, and she is in Krakow right now, uh, joining us by Zoom. Thank you for joining the show, Danuta. As I told you before, it's a beautiful name, Polish name. Yeah. Thank um, you for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. So tell us uh, how you got associated with Project Expedite Justice, uh, and you know, or, and whether you are uh, the only one in in um, uh, in Krakow, or whether there are others in Krakow or other parts of Poland. Um, so I believe at the moment I am the only one from Krakow. And as I know, I am the only Polish one, uh, the po or the only Polish member. And um, um, I really wanted to apply to work with an organization that um, is predominantly focused on victims and on victims of international crimes. And kind of through the search, um, I found projects by Night Justice. And I applied, and I got the chance to to work with the organization. Why? Why are you interested in Project Expedite Justice and its work? I am um, I am interested in the broader topic of international criminal justice and international humanitarian justice, and both of these subjects uh, are the work of Project Expedite Justice. Um, and with um, this predominant focus on the victims, I thought I can approach um, international criminal law and also international human rights law from this victim-centric perspective. So, um, but you're you're different. Your orientation is different. You're into this kind of holistic approach to it. Uh, can you describe the difference for me? Um, between your approach and other people's approach. I mean, for example, we've had many shows, many talk shows like this with Project Expedite Justice, and some of them are into, you know, commissions. Some of them are into investigations of war crimes, prosecution of war crimes in various uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, I guess people have different approaches. Your approach seems very different. So tell me what it is. Um. Um, well, in terms of transitional justice, I believe that transitional justice is, a, is an approach in itself. It's not really a type of justice. And um, it can be a set of uh, processes or one process. It can be both judicial and non-judicial kind of mechanisms that are going to be um, designed and implemented. Uh, but what I mean by a holistic approach is that uh, there is a number of avenues that can be pursued. And ideally, I believe that um, they should be uh, pursued uh, simultaneously and should complement one another. So to um, establish and design a realistic view that is going sort of to uh, be bestly uh, adapted to the specific cultural or um, historical context of a conflict in question. Hmm. Yes, let me ask you about that. The historical context, uh, is there uh, some history here? Is there history that suggests that holistic transitional justice has had uh, success in the past? Um, or is it something we're inventing right now? Um, well, I think that uh, in general, when, um, for example, there was a country which um, which suffered from armed hostilities, or where there was an, for example, international conflict between two sovereign states, or when there was a regime change, um, I believe that usually how the old or new governments try to approach the top or the issue or uh, kind of uh, the way to move forward is by the adoption of a set of different measures. So I try to see it as more of a holistic approach, not sort of narrowing down to one specific, for example, I don't know, prosecutions, but also, for example, thinking about truth commissions, thinking about ski reparation schemes for the victims, 
So I believe it's sort of like a broader set of approaches. So it doesn't uh, rule out some of the other approaches. Sometimes no. you, no. you have to have a hybrid, right? Where you're yeah. using more than one approach at the time. But I, mm -hmm. I take it from our discussion that um, when we say holistic, that, is, that would be your primary way of looking at it. Although uh, you may look at it through other lenses, your primary approach is through a holistic approach. Mm, yeah. 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 Um, okay. Uh, do you believe that a holistic approach with, you know, a hybrid version of a holistic approach is the most uh, effective way to deal mm -hmm. with with war crimes and violations of human rights? Why? Why is that? Tell me your analysis. Um, so, well, I believe that um, every avenue towards uh, this broader goal of achieving sustainable peace has its pros and cons. Um, so, for example, we can look, uh, look at uh, prosecutions. Uh, so one can make a division between international prosecutions and also domestic prosecutions. And I believe uh, if this is possible, it is ideal to organize uh, both in the same time. So both international prosecutions and domestic prosecutions can complement one another and can sort of try to um, share the caseload to prevent uh, undue delay. But there are some weaknesses in this um, approach to uh, transitional justice. And I believe that the sort of one of the main weaknesses is that the mandate of the court is limited. And the primary um, kind of emphasis is put on the perpetrators and on finding them guilty or proving um, that they committed the atrocities. And sort of, um, and in this approach, the victims um, are treated as tools uh, sort of for the case of the prosecution or the defense. And also the testimony that ca they can share before the court is very fragmented. Um, so there are also other approaches that are a bit more victim centric, uh, for example, truth commissions. And these are, um, they can be a mixture of judicial and non-judicial bodies, but usually they are non-judicial inquiries. And uh, they sort of try to, the members of the commission try to understand the root causes of the conflict, try to understand the history, especially the conflict um, spread over decades. Uh, then they really try to also understand the societal divisions and um, they are much more flexible than courts. Uh, so also in terms of the, um, uh, kind of like the, the sketching a broader picture of the atrocity and of the crimes, um, they can also uh, provide a sort of a more flexible engagement with the victims and with the public. Also, they can act even if, for example, there are court proceedings in a country and there is also a truth commission, the members of the troop commission can act as intermediaries between the court and the local public. So from this perspective, if there are plenty of victims and the conflict um, was, um, um, was um, spreading over decades and was very complex, um, it's also of value to establish, for example, such a body as a troop commission. Are you, um, are you focusing your efforts in Poland or Eastern Europe, uh, more than Africa, Latin America, or other places? Um, actually, when I was thinking about truth commissions, I was thinking about Colombia, because there was a civil, a civil conflict uh, going back from 1960s, I believe. And um, only recently there was a report issued by the by the commission and the report was detailing very exhaustively um, the history of the conflict because it was spreading over such a long time. Uh, so I believe uh, also when there are some when there are internal conflicts between the government and the rebels, um, they are really taking a long time. I think um, having a truth commission that is really trying to kind of 
look uh, beyond the prosecutions of the selected individuals and try to understand really and try to sort of also propose the way to move forward. I believe that um, it is really our value. So um, have you have you been there? Have you been to Latin America? I, I talked last uh, last time we talked to Stella. Did you meet Stella? Stella, um, I think his name, his name her name is Pizarro or Pizzato in Italy. Um, she's in Verona. Uh, she's also with Project Expedite Justice. If I, uh, is it Sylvia? No, or, well, no, uh, no Sylvia. No, Sylvia's in Spain. No. We've okay, met no. Sylvia too. Yeah. And all yeah. you guys are great, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have you have you traveled to Colombia? Have you traveled to, no, to Africa? Never, no, never been. Okay, so I, I want to talk about Poland for a minute. Poland has a sort of a rough history. In the nineteenth to twentieth century, there's a lot of violence in Poland. There were atrocities in Poland around the war and the and the uh, Nazi occupation and so forth. Um, yeah. Does this color your view of it? Does this motivate you in any way? Are you a student of Polish history? Um, well, of course, I used to have Polish history in school, uh, but actually, I would like to sort of use Poland uh, as a example, one example of the case study for now. And I would like to talk um, about um, um, sort of um, and when I believe that the fundaments of any talk or any more meaningful conversation about transitional justice is establishing kind of uh, an open and inclusive debate about what has actually happened in the past. And I believe that the societies that don't manage to get the accountability right um, start from a very wrong direction. And um, it is important um, to sort of try to balance this desire of revenge but also uh, with this um, um, kind of um, uh, aim and goal of uh, healing the nation, of trying to unify a nation, trying to really engage the entire public in this um, broader debate. We have a uh, word in, uh, in Hawaiian, the Hawaiian language, and mm -hmm. it is ho'oponopono, uh, which mm -hmm. is the same notion of healing. Yeah. Um, um, but if you have healing and if you have a holistic approach, aren't you, uh, isn't it necessary for you to exclude revenge? Isn't it necessary for you to temper punishment that you would otherwise mete out? Um, you know, like after the war, there was some people, some, some defendants were put to death for what they had done. Um, would you not do that now? Would you uh, exclude um, a violent retribution? No, I believe uh, that also one should really look at uh, actually what the nation and what the victims desire and what the general public wants. Um, I also believe that uh, definitely international or domestic prosecutions are key uh, to sort of uh, bring this feeling of justice, of bring this feeling of... of um, of trying to to sort out what happened in the past and uh, move uh, move to the future. So I believe that if there is this possibility of having prosecutions and there are perpetrators uh, that can be caught, I think uh, definitely a country or a government should consider um, having trials. Mm. And punishment. Um, well, I believe that um, Prosecutions is not only about uh, this kind of uh, actual or, or uh, material punish, punishment of the perpetrator. I, I think it's this broader symbolic process because prose prosecu prosecutions also carry this more of a uh, broader meaning to the public. And I believe that this is also uh, trying to bring uh, peace uh, to the nation. So I, I told you before the show, I wanted to have a case study with you. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can explore the corners of all that. And uh, for this case study, I'm making myself a Ukrainian, uh, a survivor. Imagine me. I come to see you. I guess I, I talk to you on the phone or maybe I visit you or we have a, a Skype or Zoom call or 
some kind mm -hmm. of you know meeting. And I tell you that um, I've been wounded and maimed. And I tell you that my children and my family have been uh, killed or tortured or removed, you know, uh, deported into Russia. I tell you that my, my home has been destroyed and that all my assets are gone. I am impoverished. Um, I really don't know what to do. Uh, I want to see the Ukrainians uh, win. I want, I want to see retribution against the Russians. Because they, and I don't believe there's any excuse for what they have done to me, my family, and virtually millions of other Ukrainians. Um, and I, I need justice. That's why I'm, I'm here talking to you. I need justice. Mm -hmm. What is the conversation like, and what can you offer me? Well, um, so um, um, there is um, this principle um, of um, approaching any of the victims. Um, the, the principle is called do not harm. And this is um, about uh, sort of um, the approach is centered around the psychological um, kind of um, well-being of the victim. And it's about not trying to push the victim um, towards uh, the edge of uh, of testifying many, many times. So definitely if uh, a victim um, such as you presented uh, has suffered from such uh, horrific crimes uh, in their home state, uh, definitely whenever anyone would approach uh, such a person, uh, they would try to gather the testimony in one go. And they will try not to further harm the victim because, as you presented it, it um, then um, to kind of prevent the victim from further suffering, um, the investigators uh, should uh, approach it, approach such a victim very cautiously. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the the desire of the victim, or um, sort of. Um, the the thing uh, the the ultimate aim that the victim believes is is important. I feel that this is sort of approached on a case by case basis, uh, because definitely there would be this feeling of uh, of revenge, of uh, of um, holding uh, the perpetrators accountable for what has happened, uh, but. One should also keep in mind that there are also victims, because when it comes to, for example, prosecutions, uh, one has to remember that um, the perpetrators that are ultimately trialed, uh, tried in court is only a selected number of individuals that were caught and then also against whom the prosecution built a solid case. So there are also victims, for example, uh, whose, uh, whose uh, perpetrators who perpetrated the crimes against them, for example, were never caught. And this was also the situation after the Second World War II. Um, only a few uh, were actually tried. Some were never caught. Yes. Uh, so it's also important that, uh, unfortunately, prosecutions are not only this, uh, this key to justice. And it's also important to have also other initiatives. Yes. Well, are you going to try in this conversation of ours, are you going to try to um, open the subject of forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in some ways, uh, that 18-year-old kid, uh, a Russian soldier who mm -hmm. is doing atrocities, he's, in a way, he's being encouraged, if not forced, to do what he's doing. Uh, mm -hmm. He may he may go much further, you know, just by virtue of the human animal aspect of it. Um, but you know, if he was standing there in the street in Buka, and uh, and seeing them, you know, shoot people in the back of the head, um, it would be hard to forgive. And um, and and many other circumstances in Ukraine. That's just one of hundreds, okay. thousands of examples. Um, but query, um, would you talk to me about finding? room in my heart to forgive what has happened? I believe that there is going to be a part of the society or part of the victims um, that will never really be able to forgive. 
Um, and I believe that um, this is sort of not the responsibility of those who try to bring justice uh, to also convince uh, those who suffered because no one can um, put themselves into the shoes of the victim. No one can really experience what they have suffered. Um, I also believe that there are going to be victims who will ultimately uh, decide to forgive, even though, for example, they lost a family or they lost lost their beloved ones. Um, so it's all sort of assessed on a case by case basis. And it's a very, very delicate and sensitive subject. Uh, so but this forgiveness can also come with time. It can also come uh, with um, yeah, for example, with uh, different different avenues for accountability, it can also uh, come from the broader public engagement and discussions about the topic. This sort of trying to engage in an open, open and inclusive debate about what has happened. Also, uh, the survivors, for example, who are willing to talk about uh, their experiences and their point of view. Um, if they are, of course, um, in a position, for example, to share what has happened uh, with those who uh, did not experience and sort of like to show uh, their approach and their vision or whether uh, there is any room in their mind or hearts to try at least maybe not to forgive, but maybe uh, to understand also uh, the way in, in which the perpetrators um, tried or were, were sort of motivated to um, maybe not, not maybe not to try to understand, um, but try to look at it also from a different perspective. Well, it strikes me that, um, you know, you must be under a lot of pressure to deal with the various outcomes that you can have. You can make me understand, conceivably, you could make me understand to the point where I, I appreciate, you know, the human condition, and therefore I, 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 I regard what happened with some sympathy, some empathy, forgiveness. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you also imply that uh, we want to bring this to the attention of the community. We want the community to know about it. Um, and finally, uh, you talk about, um, you know, prosecution and justice and punishment. Um, and you and you mentioned also early on that different circumstances uh, call for different approaches, a different mix of all these 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 missions, these goals. Um, but you know, uh, I think at the end of the day, for me, as I uh, appreciate you and Project Expedite Justice, I am. I am. Uh, I'm thinking of the uh, the Jewish slogan after the Warsaw uprising, the Warsaw massacre. You know, in the ghetto, was never again. We must never let this happen again. And uh, for many years, you know, people, you know, not only Jewish people but people of 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 good heart, re remembered that and said, "We are not going to let this happen again. We'll do what we have to do." Um, but you know, here we are today, Danuka, and uh, Danuka, and and uh, we find that it is happening again. As a member of a you know a human rights organization, you know that uh, we all know that it is happening again. There are atrocities, and so um, you know, how do you reconcile that ultimate goal of preventing you know the atrocities from ever, ever, ever happening again? with the reality they are happening again. What else can you do? What can we do to, f I shouldn't say finally, but to at least for a while, stop these atrocities? I believe uh, that having open and honest conversations about what has happened in the past, um, trying constantly to educate uh, people um, about uh, the actual history, both about the bright and dark sides of what has happened in the past, and um, sort of learn those lessons, not not to forget about them, because the history, 
unfortunately tends to repeat itself. Uh, so it's important to to remember about what has happened in the past and to look kind of um, backwards, um, get get this knowledge, uh, get this acknowledgement, and then try to to use it um, in the future. Mm, hope so, knock wood, as they say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, where is it going for you? I mean, I, are you? Do you feel that your work is effective? Are you having gratification? Um, do you believe that um, your work will continue through your life? That you will make a material difference? You know, it's a it's a race, isn't it? It's it's a race of of um, you know violations of human rights versus those who would oppose the violation of human rights. And sometimes, uh, just me now. Sometimes I think we're losing that that competition. Uh, how do you feel about it? And and how committed are you to spending your life dealing with it? Um, well, of course, one can look at this from the perspective that human rights uh, violations are constantly ongoing. But I believe it's a constant struggle. It's um, there are people who are going to to claim that it's um, I don't know that it's ineffective or inefficient. Uh, but I believe that the society can change. And through the open conversation, uh, through the inclusive debate, and um, also through these conversations, uh, more people are becoming um, intrigued uh, by what is going on. They want to be involved. They want to um, uh, kind of uh, give uh, their piece uh, to this broader talk. Um, so I believe that no one should give up. It is important to to keep kind of uh, the flow going, and um, it is important to um, to talk about it with the broader public. You know, I feel that um, you know history moves on, and uh, you know the news cycle moves on, mm -hmm. and we have so many distractions. The United States is uh, replete with distractions every day. Uh, the news cycle is filled with distractions that take us off what we should be thinking about and doing. And, um, you know, a, a few weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. Ukraine was the top of the headlines every day. And the outrages that were happening there, uh, Vladimir Putin's, uh, in, in, you know, insanity uh, that is happening there was uh, on everybody's mind. But, but the news cycle moves on. Yeah. The, the atrocities continue, but they're not on the headlines. And um, people forget about it because they are distracted with other news. It's the way it works. It's the, it's the news stack, the stack of priorities in the news. Mm -hmm. And you get tired. You know, you, you get fatigued with hearing about atrocities all day. And so the result is that despite the efforts of the EU and NATO and various Western countries, including the the people of Poland, who I know care a lot about mm -hmm. taking care of the Ukrainians, that's been clear. Um, but but it just seems to me that as time goes by, um, the interest of the world in Ukraine is less. And I feel this, this itself is a news story. We can't mm -hmm. stop thinking about it, just as we can't stop thinking about climate change. We can't stop thinking, but we must continue. So therefore, it seems to me that part of your work and the work of Project Expedite Justice is to have conversations just like this one, Danuta, um, that uh, we need to get the word out. We need to remind people that the atrocities continue even as we speak, that the effort must go on. Uh, don't you agree? And are you involved in that? And, and um, you know, are you, are you speaking to the press? Are you speaking to the public? I think what is important uh, to remember is not to um, let the public get used to that situation. I think this is important to all the time talk about what is going on to to re to kind of try to uh, to remember that uh, this situation is uh, it cannot be normalized. It should not be normalized. It's it's uh, it's still war. Um, it's of an unprecedented scale uh, since the Second World War II. Uh, there are also, of course, other conflicts happening around the world. 
Um, but when it comes to Poland and when it comes to Europe, this is a conflict uh, that is very close to us. So definitely we can kind of um, feel um, feel it's um, feel it's maybe not its presence, but we can we can feel the impact of it. Yeah. Uh, are you are you one of a number of people that you know that feel this way? Um, is is your view well well held uh, um, in 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 Poland, uh, uh, or do you find yourself uh, alone? No, I, I believe there is a, the majority of the public um, definitely um, wants to talk about the war. Um, there is also a big feeling of uh, solidarity between um, Poles and between Ukrainians. Um, for I can give an example of my family. For example, uh, we were hosting uh, refugees from Ukraine um, to uh, um, a marriage. Um, so there is this uh, bigger feeling of trying to unite um, when the worst is happening. And um, I believe that in Poland, uh, there was a huge wave of trying to help. Um, people were shocked. Um, definitely still people are shocked. And now is, this is the time to not that, let them... Um, kind of um, get used to this situation because it's still an, an unprecedented um, war and um, no one should normalize it. No, uh, amen to that. Well, do you, do you find that, um, that this has a dynamic, uh, a resonance in your own thinking? I mean, for example, if I put myself in your shoes now, uh, I would say that the my experience in dealing with the issue, my investigation, mm -hmm. my discussion with people who have been victims in one way or another would would change me. It would change my way of looking at things, change me permanently, change my view of the world, humanity, of the Russians, of, of Western Europe, of Eastern Europe. Um, I would I would be a different person after a while. Has that happened to you? Definitely, I am. Um, I changed. <laughs> Definitely, um, the situation, um, also the reaction of my friends. I also have friends, uh, for example, from Russia, uh, who are also very personally affected by what is going on. Uh, they also oppose the government. Uh, so I believe this is this mixture of uh, my own um feelings and interpretation of what is going on but also of people surrounding me and also of my friends who also have gone through a lot and um, so definitely i'm trying to stay kind of um, uh, on track and all the time um, uh, try to think about uh, what is going on yeah well you know truth is that although it's pretty awful um, in, in the Ukraine, um, Putin's invasion attack of perfectly peaceable people, peaceful people. Um, fact is, I'm sure you know from Project Expedite Justice that it happens around the world in, di if in different degrees, in different ways, uh, different circumstances, but there are human violations, violations of human rights everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are people who, who live their lives behind barbed wire in suffering in the world yeah, and so um and I'm, I'm wondering whether your view of it is is global or is it european or is it eastern european i mean how do you see this is this a global thing for you or is it more european thing for you i don't try to look at it from the perspective of a of a region i try to Maybe also it's not really um, from this kind of global purview, uh, but I am trying to look at each case in a separate way. And I also know that um, one suffering, for example, is not um, comparable or similar in any way to the suffering of someone else. And each conflict has its 
it's the roots of each conflict um, are very different and each society and each conflict really deserves to be studied in a separate way and receive uh, its own individual treatments and um, kind of um, this um, creation of a specific um, avenue uh, for for moving forward and for healing and that's why i believe um, um, I believe um, the approach that should be pursued when it comes to transitional justice is really to approach um, everything from this holistic perspective and to try to look at the broader picture, uh, but also remember that every conflict uh, has its own peculiarities. And it's important to design the measures that are really um, adapted to this um, context of the conflict. You know, I, just a comment from me. Uh, I hear about these stories and and I give thanks and that I can wake up in the morning and, and not be the victim of um, this kind of human rights violation. You know, there but for the grace of God go I mm -hmm. and you and everyone. Thank you. And it's, it's hard for me to believe there are those who would spend their time violating the rights, the human rights of others. It's very hard for me to believe that. I'm sure you have the, the same problem. Okay, we're, we're about out of time. So do that. Can, can you just give your closing message to people in the United States? What should they be thinking about? Uh, what should their priorities be about this? What would you offer them to, you know, to have a, a, a better understanding of what is going on in your world? I believe that um, that what is the key to sort of any approach to healing and to moving forward is to engage in an open conversation with everyone, with um, all the stakeholders uh, which are involved, not only in, for example, conflicts, but also when it comes to uh, societal divisions. And this, I believe, this is... Um, you mean societal divisions like we have here in the United States, those divisions too? We also have them in Poland, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's it's not only um, the problem happening in the US. Um, so I believe that um, trying to have those as inclusive and, and as honest debates as possible, I believe that this is really the key to move forward and also to learn from the past mistakes. Thank you, Danuta. Uh, Danuta Palacek, uh... We really appreciate your joining us for this discussion, and we appreciate your work and your service to humanity. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.